presentation. Well, welcome everyone, and and thank you for joining us today. Uh, Suzanne had asked me if uh, you know after in the fall, as some of these topics became more front and center in the financial world, if we could you know go through and and, and review some of the the specific terms, inflation causes, what is stagflation, when was the last time we had it, what is the cause, what the root cause, and and you know how is it fixed. Um, and I'll briefly touch on disinflation, reflation. We'll also talk about what's called hyperinflation and the genesis of uh, how it comes about, because it's something that we really, during the great moderation, haven't seen recently. And then more importantly, um, we'll discuss uh, later on in the presentation, you know, what you can do in your portfolios to insulate them from these different, uh, these different terms and uh, what we can do in financial markets or our preferred investments uh, as we go into an inflationary environment, which we have. So that being said, I want to make a couple quick uh, public service announcements uh, coming up here in March is when we do the, for those of you that are entering into a Social Security age or making a difficult decision for Social Security and Medicare, uh, we'll be doing those presentations in October. Suzanne, I'm sure, has the dates, but we do a, a primer on Social Security. We go through a bunch of terms and, and different things. Uh, different facets of, of the system and claiming strategies. And then we do an advanced one where we actually go through some case studies. So I encourage you, if you're at that age or you have some questions on it, uh, that you join us for that. So obviously it's free. Same thing with the Medicare presentation. And then the other thing I'm gonna ask uh, this smaller group that we have today of 20 of you or so, uh, if you have some feedback today for Suzanne, I'm looking for topics for February, March, April, and May. Um, I, you know, sometimes, uh, I look back on all the presentations I've done over the last 10, 11, 12 years, and I, I like to not repeat them too often. Uh, I definitely know we're coming around where we probably need to discuss annuities again and how annuities fit into a portfolio. But other than that, I'd like uh, some input from, from all of you if you have time uh, or if you have some feedback to please give me some ideas uh, on things that we can discuss. So it seems like whenever I do these presentations in uh, January, February, March, they're always around a timing of some type of very volatile event um, where we probably need to talk about markets real quick and what's going on and then come back to what the big presentation is. So let's go next slide here because I want, as a reminder, um, <clears throat> just a little bit of context of where we're at today. Next slide, you know, S&P, I believe, is sitting in the 4,200 range, uh, Dow, mid 30,000s. You know, I, just to be clear, because sometimes when we have markets that are extremely volatile, uh, you know, we see these headline figures Dow down 1,100 points. If anybody was watching yesterday, intraday, meaning within the uh, trading hours, 6.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. here on the uh, Pacific, on the West Coast, uh, you know, the Dow started the morning down about 1,100 points, which is about a 3% move, and uh, then recovered to actually end up for the day. Quite a volatile session. For those of you that are a little bit more technical, something called the volatility index or the VIX, spiked nearly up to 40, which implies at least a two standard deviation move in the markets, which means we've been looking at, you know, 3% moves one way or another. These are pretty monumental uh, moves in the market, right? And fault when it's scary and you know, people get concerned and they start to abandon their goals and people panic. And uh, I was working out in the gym yesterday at noon and I saw on, on the CNBC headline, panic selling ensues. That's the time when you really have to take a step back and go, what you know, what is going on? What has fundamentally changed, right? So between uh, a month ago, when we were celebrating the, the Christmas holidays for most, some, um, or whatever holiday you, you, you celebrate, and today, what has fundamentally, fundamentally changed in the economy? Are we going into a recession? We would argue that the answer to that is no. Recessions are usually the only things that cause dips in the market of greater than 20%, or what we call a bear market. But naturally, within the market, annualized every single year, we have a 10% correction in the S&P 500. That is the average. We haven't had one of those since November of 2020. So we were way overdue. Last year was a very, very non-volatile year, even though you know, maybe politically or you know, COVID or headline-wise, you may have thought it was a very volatile year. But in the markets, it was pretty calm, all right? You know, 6 7% uh, pullback was the greatest that we saw, and that was on the NASDAQ for the entire year. That's a B I don't think was down, but more, you know, just over 5% once in 2021. It's a very, very benign year when we look at equity markets. And a lot of that was because of all the monumental amount of stimulus that was coming in from the Fed. Well, as soon as that stimulus starts to come out, that's when we start to see, see things like volatility in the markets, right? Not propped up by the Fed. 
So as a reminder, I want to put this chart up here because these are our end of the year targets for the end of this year. You can see there in the S&P 500 index, we're targeting between 5,100 and 5,300 right at, at the end of uh, December of 2022, if that pans out or even like to take the low side of that, that's a pretty healthy return. That's nearly a 20% return from where we are right now in the S&P 500. It's hard sometimes to look through the fog of a correction like this and all the volatility and all the things you see in the headlines, particularly CNBC and Bloomberg, but that's where we're looking at it. And we look at it from the standpoint of S&P 500 earnings or what those companies that are in the S&P 500 are gonna have for earnings and what that should mean for you uh, from a standpoint of what the index should be at, okay? We're looking at GDP growth at about four and a half percent this year. That's way above average, okay? So economy continues to grow, which is going to cr increase inflationary pressure. And if just if you look down at some of the different metrics down below, the Russell Midcap Index, Small Cap Index, all of those figures that we have for the end of the year are showing anywhere between 10 and 20% gains is what we're predicting for the year. So if you're very, very concerned and you're worried about what the markets are doing right now, I can certainly take questions at the end of the presentation. But I want to be clear, right, that this is yet a blip. This should be viewed as an opportunity to either rebalance your portfolio or get out your shopping list. I always love talking to clients. I say, you know, if there's a sale at the local department store down the street, right, everybody's rushing in the door to get there to you know, to buy the clothes off the rack or whatever it happens to be. But when there's a sale in the markets on Wall Street, everybody does the exact opposite. They want to go for the exit door and they want to sell everything they got at a discount, right? So try not to be, uh, you know, try not to subject yourself to that psychology. Turn off CNBC, turn off the news, turn off the financial news, right? The world is definitely not coming into an end. Next slide. <clears throat> A couple other important metrics, and is if we look at different asset classes and our prediction, and I say our prediction, this would be the Wells Fargo Investment Institute. But if you look at their prediction for the end of the year, if you look at a 10-year treasury yield at the end of the year prediction at 2 to 2.5%, well, what does that mean? A 10-year treasury is just a 10-year government bond, okay? All right, considered very safe because it's issued by the U.S. Treasury. All right, so right now we're sitting at about 1.75 on the 10-year. So if it goes up to 2 to 2.5, remember the inverse relationship between in bonds between interest rate and price if interest rates are going to go up that price is going to come down so your bonds actually will probably decrease in value this year just like they did at least your government bonds did last year and your municipals and corporates were pretty much flat for the year okay so you definitely need to maintain that equity or that stock sleeve in your portfolio because bonds quite frankly if interest rates rise like they are and they tend to rise especially in an inflationary environment and as the fed continues to pull liquidity out of the system and raise interest rates, that's gonna be very damaging to bonds. So they may have this perception of being safe, but if you take one thing away from today's presentation, in an inflationary environment, fixed income, or bonds as we like to call them, are probably, well, their bonds are very different, but say the safer the bond is and the longer term or longer dated it is, actually the more risk it carries due to something called interest rate risk. Next slide. So let's get back. So I just wanted to put that in context um, for this presentation that, you know, despite all the stuff that's going on, all this noise that's going around today, things aren't, if you look under the hood, things aren't as bad as one may perceive. And inflation is actually proving that. Okay. So what is inflation? It's just how, how the government measures, right? Inflation is a general increase in prices and fall in the purchasing power of money. Well, when you retire or as you retire, one of the most important things in your portfolio is to maintain what's called your purchasing power. Your purchasing power allows you to be able to purchase goods and services for the same price adjusted for inflation, right? So if inflation is going up 2% or 3% per annum and you have all of your money in money market and it's paying 0.01%, your real rate of return is negative 2.99% if inflation is running at three, meaning you're losing 2.99% of your purchasing power every year. To think of that into a monetary figure, if you just say had a million dollars in your portfolio, and I'm just taking that for an easy number, and I know many of you don't, and some of you may have, but if you have a million dollars in your portfolio, inflation's running at 3%, right? That's 30,000 a year, and you have everything in money mark, which is 0.01% a year, right? Which means you're getting $1,000 on your, you're throwing roughly 29,000 away each and every year, all right? That's how purchasing power works. So a, a term you may hear in, if you're watching CNBC or even the news is consumer price index. And that's just simply a measure of the average change over time and the prices paid by urban consumers for a market basket, basket of consumer goods and services, right? 
So this is a basket that they put together and has all these different things. And then you have core consumer price index. It's equal to CPI or the consumer price index minus energy and food prices. So they strip out those two very, very volatile inputs and use it to measure what they call core inflation. Okay, next slide. So why is it a concern or what's happened over the last year, right? Well, consumer prices in 2021 rose by 7%. That's the largest increase in any calendar year since 1981. So I just you know, take a quick survey of you out there. How many of you remember the late 70s and early 80s when we had mortgage rates, the 15% rates, right? You had CDs that were paying 10% plus, right? You had bonds that were paying 12 to 15%. Try to go out and get a mortgage to purchase a home, you're paying 16, 17, 18% per annum, right? That's pretty large inflation. <clears throat> so this is the, the largest increase literally since 1981, okay? And as a result, politicians, of course, uh, you know, across the political spectrum are working over time to find someone to blame. Next slide. Why do we really need to think about inflation? Well, first of all, we really haven't had to think about it at all since the late 70s and early 80s. You can see here, this is just a chart of inflation on the left side. We have the average annual percent uh, inflation rate. You go all the way back to the early 1900s, World War I and World War II, great massive rates of inflation down below. Uh, at the Great Depression, you could see prices falling by 10%. You may think, well, that's a great thing. No, that's actually not a good thing at all. It's called deflation, right? Prices actually going down versus going up. And we'll get to some of the, the, the specifics of what causes this. And then we get into the 70s there, right? And the oil embargo and OPEC and all these, these external things that caused a you know, rapid increase in inflation where inflation is running 10 plus percent. And then in the early 80s, that was broken, right? That was broken by the Fed aggressively raising interest rates which then led to a two-year recession. And so I think that's part of the concern right now. As you can see here in the great moderation, the 80s, 90s, 2000s, interest rates have literally just continued to come down and down and down and down, right? And now we're going into a reversal of that, right? And it affects parts of our portfolios. It affects our consumption patterns. It affects what we pay at the pump. It affects what we pay for housing. It affects what we pay for food. It, pay, it affects particularly uh, as we go into retirement, it affects what we pay for medical uh, services, right? And so all of these things should be of a concern to you in retirement, okay? And so what are we gonna do about it? So next slide, please. Next slide, please. There we go. All right, so what, what has been one of the things that has exacerbated or, or has caused this? Well, this is the Fed balance sheet, meaning, what, how much money essentially, just to kind of break it down, how much money the Fed has put into the monetary system or into the general economy? And you can see literally it's gone exponential since COVID. And that is, um, you know, due to COVID stimulus, right? That is due to uh, uh, the infrastructure bill that was just passed. And this is also why you have so many pundits out there. And again, I'm not here to be political left or right, that are arguing greatly against the Build Back Better plan right? Because that would be another three trillion. You can see over here on the left, if we're a total assets increase of, you know, say nine trillion, you know, adding that would add another 25, 30% to the Fed balance sheet, which means that goes into the economy. So what happens, all right? What causes inflation? What's the root cause? Well, this Fed expansion of its balance sheet is a huge issue because, <clears throat> And, and part of it needed to be done, especially during COVID. We needed stimulus. We needed people, you know, that were laid off or unemployed, uh, getting their unemployment benefits, et cetera, et cetera. But at some point, you have to pull that back out. Or what happens is you get too much money in the system chasing too few goods. Okay? Look at housing. Why does housing go up? Because you have so much demand for housing, and you only have a certain amount of houses that are being sold. Right? So people outbid each other. You've probably heard stories. I just had a client come to me and say that they were trying to buy a, uh, help their daughter buy a, a condo in Los Angeles. Uh, I think it was for sale for 900000 or a million bucks or something like that. Right? A starter condo. It's hard to believe nowadays. The, the condo would end up the winning bid for the condo. It went for 300000 over asking price, all cash. Think about that for a second. It went for a 30% premium over the asking price for all cash right? That is too much money chasing two food, goods, and services. Next slide. So, <clears throat> you know, this is a pretend it's changed from a year ago, the consumer price index, right? And you can see here, we have this long drawn down kind of slow, slow, gradual decline. And then boom, right as soon as we get to 2021, as all this stimulus from COVID 
and the infrastructure plan, right? All of it goes out and gets into the economy. And now we have this reversal where we have all these goods and services that are trying to get out to consumers, but we cannot keep up. The supply chain cannot keep up with the aggregate demand. And that is how you get inflation, rapid inflation. Next slide. So, um, so what's the response, right? So the Fed immediately, um, not immediately, I should say, after a, quite a significant delay, you may remember all through 2021, if you have for listen to Chairman Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve, speak, he would say, you know, inflation is transitory, it's transitory. Well, at some point they had to acknowledge that it's not transitory, right? And so, first of all, if we go back to, to, to March of 2020, when the market fell 32%, unemployment was well over 10%, you go into a deflationary environment, meaning prices are coming down because, again, people don't have jobs. They don't have money. They're chasing fewer goods and services. So when, when the Fed looks at inflation a year later in March 2021, it's going to show a big number because it was after you know, the, the biggest or most rapid decrease in employment this country's ever seen, right, due to the, the COVID pandemic. So when they were saying transitory, 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 they're expecting as things smoothed out and as uh, the, the March, April, May of 2020 fell off for a 12 month uh, inflation number or CPI number, they expected that transitory to go away. But what has happened is there has been a backlog, again, in the supply chains. And on top of that, more stimulus coming out of Washington, D.C., which, quite frankly, is not helpful at this point at all. It's only going to cause much more inflation. And again, this is not a political standpoint. I'm telling you this from the standpoint of finance and economics that you throw another $3 trillion into the economy, it is highly, highly likely that you're going to get massive inflation because there's going to be so much money out there choosing so many few goods and services. Next slide. So why are we worried about inflation? Next slide. Well, again, as I said, it affects your purchasing power. And so if we just look here, and I got three slides in a row, and we're going to build on each slide. So the first slide is stocks, bonds, treasury bills, and inflation, 1926, so just prior to the Great Depression, all the way through 2017. Okay, and the gray at the bottom is inflation, and you can see treasury bills just barely eke out over inflation. Your government bonds, slightly above that. And then, of course, large stocks, which would be S&P 500, small stocks above that, which would be the Russell 2000. Right? So this all looks great, but then we go to the next slide and we add inflation in, okay? So what your return is after, oh, I'm sorry, let's start with taxes. So after taxes, right? Because you know, if, if we don't have uh, these investments held in a retirement account, if they're held in a, a trust account or an investment account of some kind that does, isn't tax sheltered, then what happens is that inflation or that gray box suddenly turns treasury bills into a negative real rate of return and barely gets you any return over this long, long period of time, almost 100 years, right, due to inflation. Again, stocks, you can see up at the top, still do just fine, right? It's because they're definitely an inflation hedge within them, okay? And then you could see municipal bonds, <clears throat> because they're more tax favored, they do significantly better. Now let's go to the next slide and add inflation in, all right? Here's after taxes and inflation. Here is your real return over time. You can see owning treasury bills down there at the bottom, even though it feels great and you feel you know, like, like you don't lose any money because you always get your money back. It's actually a negative real rate of, rate of return, meaning you're losing your purchasing power. Government bonds barely eke out a return. Even municipal bonds barely eke out a return. And stocks become literally one of your only safe havens against an inflationary and tax environment. Next slide. Right? So again, inflation and taxes reduce returns. So just look at compound annual returns, 1926 to 2017. It doesn't take much to realize on the right side over there, cash, right? After taxes, inflation, give a negative return. And we're not talking about like two years or 10 years. We're talking over almost a hundred year time period, right? Just over 90 years. You have a negative rate of return holding cash. And that is the problem, like in, in a very rapidly inflating environment holding cash becomes the kiss of death to your portfolio. And even if you go over one to bonds, after taxes inflation, you can see generally the Barclays aggregate, AGG, <clears throat> does not do well at all from a real rate of return. And so on the very left side, we have, to, uh, we have stocks. And this may surprise you because everybody hears large cap stocks, average annual return, 10 point, you know, 10 point whatever percent annualized. But if you factor in inflation and taxes, you're closer to 5.7%, okay? 
much lower than most people think. And you have to remember, you're also in California, which is the highest and most progressively taxed state in the union. So it takes an even bigger chunk out of that. Next slide. So what are some other issues? And let's just kind of go over some of the other terms that I mentioned so you, so you have a you know, basic understanding, right? <clears throat> and why we must plan for it. So we're living longer and must plan for longevity, right? Is it just spending habits? If you're 65 today, the probability of living to a specific age or beyond, right? I know this is a little hard to see even for me over here, but if you're 70, so the, the probability of living to 75, you know, if you're a couple, you have a 97% chance, right? If you're 65 today, what about 90? So a couple has a 50% chance of living to 90 and a 20% chance of living to 95. That's if you're 65 today. So think about that. If you're 65 and you're sitting on this presentation today and you're married and you're sitting there next to your spouse, 50% chance one of the two of you is going to live to be 90 years old, right? That's 25 years. If you're retiring today at 65, that you have to plan for this inflationary environment, right? And the larger that inflation number is, the more you need to get in return on your portfolio to maintain your purchasing power. And more importantly, right? If you're in cash 10%, 15%, 20%, because the market freaks you out, or you have 25, 30, 40% in treasury bills, as I've already shown you, you're going to continue to lose purchasing power over time, year after year after year after year after year. And it's only going to compound on itself as medical expenses continue to rise greater than your portfolio is. So one of the things, <clears throat> particularly that folks that retire in their 60s, or early 70s, a conversation we always have to have with them is you have got to keep some equity or stock exposure in your portfolio. As I've already shown you, it is the only defense, literally the only defense you're going to have long, long term, meaning 20 years plus or 10 years plus against inflation or a rising interest rate environment. Next slide. And the other thing is, as we age, our spending sh you know, shifts uh, higher to higher inflation categories. So, you know, as we're younger, we're spending things on that, that, that don't rise with inflation as much as we do with our old as we as we do when we are older particularly what medical expenses right medical expenses next slide i'll go over here in a second when it comes to medicare right medicare projected inflation is 4.2 percent per year but if we add on once you turn 65 right and all the co-pays and deductibles et cetera, et cetera, that come with medicare it's actually closer to six and a half almost up to seven percent inflation on Medicare. So that right there in and of itself, if you think about it, if that's going to be one of your largest, if not your largest expense in retirement, you've got to plan for it. Your portfolio needs to reflect it. Next slide. So again, <clears throat> we, we discussed inflation. Just one more way to look at it. Prices were cheap in the past. They rise through years. causes inflation. The rise in general level of prices of goods and services and economy over a period of time. The price levels rise. Each unit of currency is able to buy fewer goods and services, right? So again, when price levels rise, each unit of currency is, each dollar is able to buy fewer goods and services. Next slide. <clears throat> and I, as I said earlier, you know, this, uh, there, there are two sides to inflation, right? It could be a demand problem or a supply problem. I and mean, right now we have a little bit of both, right? We have all this demand coming in from massive stimulus from the federal government, and we have a supply problem. You've probably read about all the supply chain problems. You want to, you know, next time you're flying out of San Diego International Airport on Southwest or whatever airline, if you turn north and you go towards Long Beach or LA, I would highly encourage you to look out the window and see the backlog of ships in Long Beach and LA waiting to get in the ports, right? And they're trying to deliver these goods and services. And quite frankly, the administration, again, this is not a political thing, to, to, if they really want to tackle inflation, that's where it starts because that's the supply chain that's bringing those goods and services in right? And then those goods and services need to get out. Another problem, <clears throat> and I, I'll give you just a, uh, an example of uh, up here where uh, you know, my wife and I live here in Lake Tahoe, Incline Village full time. We have our place in Cardiff uh, that we spend a lot of time down there as well. But one of the issues we have had here in Incline Village, which is in Lake Tahoe, uh, just on the Nevada side this winter, is with plows uh, clearing the roads. Instead of it being the same day, we've had multiple days where we have two, three feet of snow on the road and they're impassable. Right. And one of the reasons for that, right? Again, we talk about supply dynamics or demand. 51% of the county workers in Washoe County, which is where we live, which includes Reno and Klein Village, 51% of the county workers quit due to vaccine mandates that were implemented by our governor. Again, I'm not here to politically say vaccine mandates are good or bad. I'm here to tell you what the result of that was. 
The result of that was 51% of the workers, you know, these are people that work in a snowplow by themselves, right? They quit because for whatever their political reason is, they didn't, they didn't want to get a vaccine. Okay, fine. The problem or the, the downhill to that was that now it takes two years to train a snowplow driver on a mountain pass road and they have to have a commercial driver's license. So where did all those snowplow drivers go? They went to go drive trucks, right? 18 wheelers because they have their commercial licenses. And so again, you know, sometimes the unintended consequences, we lose 51% of our snowplow drivers. It's tough to clear the roads like we used to, uh, you know, the year past. So that's kind of just a, you know, a personal example of how sometimes these supply chain things get disrupted, right? Next slide. So let's talk about some of the other terms you may have heard. Stagflation is just simply stagnation plus inflation. When I say stagnation, I'm not talking about the air or the wind. I'm talking about economic growth, meaning you're having inflation, but you're not getting any economic growth to go with it. That is a very bad thing, and that's what we had in the late 70s. It's a period where the economy is very slow and the continuous price increases equal unfavorable economic conditions. The economy is slowed by unfavorable shock, like, for example, the increase of price in oil, right, in, from due to the OPEC embargo in the 70s. Many of you that are older may uh, remember the long gas lines in the 70s, right? Waiting to fill up your car for hours upon hours upon hours, right? Can also result from inappropriate macroeconomic policies. Next slide. All right. So, you know, just last time we had stagflation in this country was in the 70s, right? They've had stagflation in, in parts of uh, uh, other parts of the, the world more recently, but here's some, you know, something maybe a little closer to us. The horrible chain of events, consumers expected continuous increases in prices result, resulted in heavy spending because you want to go out and buy that house now before it's you know, 100,000 more expensive next year, right? It increases demand, it increases the prices. And just like we talked about, if there is a dearth or a, a limit of the amount of supply of those goods and services, naturally the price is going to increase and is a never ending upward spiral. So what was the solution? Next slide. So here was the solution. President Jimmy Carter took some desperate steps. He increased government spending, which quite frankly is on the table right now, right? With, you know, these large, uh, uh, you know, bills moving through Congress, uh, voluntary wages, price guides, and quite frankly, in the late 70s, this is what a lot of pundits will po point to. It didn't work. What did work in 1980, the government of the United States loosened the controls of bank interest rates. And more importantly, you may have heard of uh, Chairman Vokler, he, quote unquote, broke the back of inflation. And what did he do? He aggressively raised rates by the Federal Reserve and it choked off the economy, but it also choked off inflation. And it caused a two year recession that was done purposely, right, to rein in inflation. And, you know, quite frankly, you look back on it, go, okay, it was a two year, you know, recession. It was really awful. But, or you can look at it as it actually did break the back of inflation and led to, uh, you know, expansion that lasted all the way through 2000, which is a 20-year expansion. This is great. Next slide. So again, cause of stagflation in the 70s, the OPEC oil crisis. Like I said, again, you know, too many people chasing too many goods and services that aren't there. Next slide. <clears throat> so maybe a term you're not aware of, but this is a little bit scary because these are the things that can happen. And one of the reasons that we really, really uh, should rein in inflation and why the Federal Reserve has two mandates, right? They target 2% inflation and they tar target low unemployment, right? So those are two mandates. Well, what is hyperinflation, right? <clears throat> Next slide. So hyperinflation, just a case here, you may have heard of Zimbabwe, right? Uh, over in Africa, the first country to have hyperinflated the 21st century. Imagine this, inflation reached 79.7 .7 billion percent monthly inflation rate in November 15th of 2008 monthly, literally. Next slide. So what does that mean realistically? Well, hyperinflation real quick is caused by large increase in the production supply of paper money, meaning the Federal Reserve or our central bank just prints a bunch of money, right? And isn't that what we do when we, um, you know, when we bring on these big economic programs or these big welfare programs or whatever, um, that's what we're doing, we're printing money. So it's a very tough balance here in the United States but in other countries that don't have the same ability as the reserve currency of the world, when monetary and fiscal authorities of federal governments issue large quantities of paper to pay for projects, you can get absolute hyperinflation. A more recent example is Venezuela. Okay. But so what does it, what did it do? All right. So in May, 2006, Zimbabwe announced the, the printing of 60 trillion Zimbabwe dollars to finance salary increase for civil workers. They wanted to raise the wages for the public sector. Right. 
Hyperinflation caused by the government is just another form of taxation, just so you know, it's called an inflation tax, right? Because the taxes that goods and services cost you more, right? And if your wages aren't wa- rising the same amount as price goods and services, right? So just, just real quick on that. So inflation rose at a 7% annual rate in 2021. Wages for workers only rose at 4.2%. So that gap is a tax, right? It's a tax on you and me and all of us. Because if our wages aren't rising as much as inflation, right? What does that mean? That means our purchasing power has gone down. That means we have le- the same amount of dollars, but they're worth less and we can't buy as many goods with them, right? So it's a, it's a very subtle tax. And that's why inflation or policies that are very inflationary need to be um, watched very, what's the way to say this? They, they need to be considered very carefully as to their potential unintended consequences. Next slide. Uh, I just see a question that popped up in chat. Social Security COLA is 5% this year. Do I miss out on this if not drawing Social Security or is the 5% baked into what I get in the future? Um, so it's baked in. So that COLA, let's say your benefit right now at full retirement age is 2000. Your full retirement age uh, benefit will go up to 2100 because that 5% will be added in. It does not matter if you're taking Social Security or not. It, it is always uh, baked in, right? <clears throat> so just an example of buying power under hyperinflation. In August 2008, again, over in Zimbabwe, right? The exchange rate to a dollar was 1,780, right? <clears throat> and then it, by the time it got to 2 November of 2008, two months, that same 1,780 Zimbabwean dollars, or I forget exactly what they're called, it required 13 quadrillion Zimbabwean dollars to purchase the same thing in two, no, excuse me, August, uh, September, October, November, four months, four months. Can you imagine that type of inflation in this country, right? It would be horrific. So again, do I think this is going to happen to us? Absolutely not. But I think it's important to understand that these can be some of the consequences of letting inflation run out of control. Next slide. So it's a vicious cycle, right? Um, I'm just going to go ahead and skip over this. Next slide. So how, how do you stop the hyperinflation? Well, essentially, the, the currency collapses, right? And the government promises to stop printing more money. Government creates a new fiscal budget. Sure, insurance can take away incentive for government to res- resort to inflationary taxation. Zimbabwe government has transitioned out of their dead currency, meaning they literally got rid of the currency. So it didn't matter how much of them you had in the bank, they were worth zero. Okay, next slide. So how do we invest in an inflationary environment? I'm getting towards the end of the presentation here, which is great, as we come up on 1240. So next slide. Well, let's start with what you should, and I say here what to avoid. I, I'm, I'm reticent to ever give advice when a big group like this because everyone is different. So I wanna be clear that I don't know any of your individual situations. I'm not a fiduciary on any of your individual uh, uh, accounts or any of your uh, uh, you know, different investments. But I think it's important to understand what in a rising inflationary environment slash rising interest rate environment, what can really hurt you? Well, I, I, I pretty much you know, said this earlier, if, if, if inflation is rising at 7% and you're holding large cash positions, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% of your portfolio because you're nervous about markets or you're nervous about particular investments, what you're really doing is losing 6.9% or 6.99% of your portfolio annualized to inflation. Again, if, that's, if you have a million dollars, right? That's six, 69,900 on uh, of the 70,000 inflationary rate that you'd be basically throwing in the fire. Buying long-term bonds, again, just to, to remind you how bonds work, prices on one side, interest rate on the other side. So if interest rates go up, right, prices are coming down, okay? Well, the further we go out on this teeter-totter, meaning the longer duration, meaning the longer that bond takes to come due, the more movement it's gonna have. So our recommendation is to stay away from long-term bonds. For example, 30-year treasury, right? Because the, the price depreciation could be pretty severe if interest rates come up. And just think about that conceptually. So if I lend you $10,000, which is essentially a bond, and you're paying me 2% in interest, and a year from now, I could lend that same 10,000 to someone else, and they're gonna pay me 3% interest, right? But I can't get the money back from you for nine more years, makes sense that the price of what I have or the bond I have would go down, right? Because if I had 10,000, spare 10,000, I could be getting more interest. And that's how the relationship works between price and interest rate, right? It's like that teeter-totter up and down. 
So another thing, and this is, this is often, so what happens is people then say, okay, I can't buy bonds. I want to buy super safe stocks. Like I'm going to buy utilities. Well, utility companies it, that have equities or that have stock are what we call bond proxies, meaning they're not a bond, right? But they act like bonds do, right? They don't move very much in price appreciation. They have a nice high dividend, but as, and as you saw yesterday, so part of all this volatility in the markets is the Fed is going to act sooner than the market thought on raising interest rates. Well, guess what the worst performing sector of the market was yesterday? Utilities. Guess what the second worst was? Consumer staples, because these are considered bond proxies when it comes to stock investing. Does that mean you avoid dividend stocks? Absolutely not. Actually, I actually think dividend stocks would be a great place to be, right? They give you purchasing power, right? They give you uh, rising income in some places. But uh, tips, good question, Donna. Uh, tips are treasury in inflation protected securities. As you'll see on my next slide, which you just beat me to, that is definitely somewhere that you may want to consider putting money versus, uh, but you, know, you also have to take a look at how much they've been bid up because of exactly the dynamic that's going in long-term bonds. Companies with high valuations and zero dividend, what am I talking about? Uh, your Teslas, your, all of your tech stocks that are what we like to call in our shop a pie in the sky stock, meaning they maybe have zero to little earnings and their valuation is based on sales. Uh, they're an unproven asset. They have no dividend. They're putting no cash back to their, their shareholders. These are very, very risky stocks in a market like this because essentially a stock that doesn't have a dividend well, I don't want to get it. That's a little hard to understand, explain. A stock that doesn't have a dividend is like a very long-term bond, okay? Because the, the way you value the stock is based on a cash flow when you're going to receive your cash flows back. But if it has no dividend, then we don't know when we're going to get our cash flow back, right? So a, a very high-flying, growthy tech type of stock, okay? And you know the names, Peloton, that's what I mean. Peloton's down 85% since the IPO over the, I think the last year. I was just looking yesterday, uh, some of the high flying biotech stocks are down 45, 50% in the last month. Uh, Moderna being one of them, one of the vaccine companies, down 45% in the last month, right? No dividend and no potential future cash flow, okay? So again, I'd be very cautious of these types of investments. Next slide. So what do we put our money into or what do we consider? Well, look at mostly here at the top. Um, these are your uh, asset class correlation with inflation or, you know, what is going to produce our best returns during inflation. Uh, someone just asked about tips. You can see down there in the bottom of the green tips is listed there. Uh, REITs, real estate investment trusts, right? Um, because they are an inflation protection uh, mechanism because uh, if you haven't noticed, housing prices were up uh, quite a bit last year and the year before as well, right? So um, they, they march up with the rate of inflation. Uh, high yield bonds. I, I'd, I'd be cautious on high yield bonds because of the spreads right now. But uh, you know, commodities for sure, right? Commodities are the basic uh, fundamental building blocks of our economy. So commodities would be oil and gold and all the different metals and different foods. Um, you know, so those are your commodities. Uh, bank loans, right? That's a, a form of, of bonds uh, that have variable interest rates and emerging market stocks. Um, one of the things that we favor, right, through the Wells Fargo Investment Institute are large cap U.S. stocks, dividend producers, growing their dividends, right, growing dividend producers. So I would think about that. Um, one of the strategies that we really like right now is a uh, covered call strategy, especially for those of you uh, that are very um, risk adverse. It's a kind of a blend of having stock and a blend of having bonds and using options, which I, I know we've discussed in other presentations. I don't want to get too far into, but it's using options to hedge or reduce risk, All right? So those are the things that we are, are looking at in today's market. Next slide. I'm gonna wrap this up here real quick, but key takeaways. Uh, you, yeah, you gotta plan you know, for these type of environments early. It's not like we just started talking about inflation. You have to look at it um, you know, ahead of time and really start positioning your portfolio for this. Um, I think you know, one of the biggest risks, again, for most people out there, okay? If you have a large, large cash position because you're worried about the market or scared of the market to the other, you really over the long term are going to be hurting yourself pretty severely in an inflationary environment, okay? Implement a portfolio to defend against those risks, including inflation and longevity, right? And inflation risks are certainly rising today. Next slide, I believe that's it. Yep, just our disclosure. So I'll end it there right at 1245. It leaves us about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, I'll jump here in the chat. 
Uh, I'll also put my email here at the bottom so that anyone uh, that has a question can send it to me directly if you don't want to ask it here in the group. Christine, go ahead. Thank you, Ryan. That was wonderful. Yes. Go ahead. Christine. Thank you. Very fast, but wonderful and very understandable, yeah. Ryan. Thank you. I apologize. I know I do tend to speak fast, but thank you. Yeah, well, you have to. You have a lot of information. So um, <laughs> my, my question and maybe a comment is, uh, what is the redistributive effect of these economic processes on the society at large? Because I mean, all the injection of the money from the government is causing some changes in the, to say mm -hmm. it bluntly, class structure of society. And uh, yeah. it is, I came out of Peru in 1990, since you mentioned Venezuela, you probably also know something about the hyperinflation in Peru and the yep. reaction of people in Peru to hyperinflation was to resort to non-monetized markets. That is, mm -hmm. they started trading with goods. And this- yep, exactly. The they went to a barter market, system. A lot of the informal sector, no, which is also existent in the United States and also the mm -hmm. peasantry in general, no? Yeah. So yeah. the yeah. larger question is a redistribution issue. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So great questions. And uh, I remember traveling to Argentina in the late 2000s and, uh, you know, sitting in coffee shops. Um, I, my mother's actually from Mexico City, so I speak Spanish. And um, we uh, had uh, conversations around, as you probably know, Argentina had hyperinflation as well and defaulted on its, its debt at one point. Um, <clears throat> and the default, you know, hit the reset button. And, you know, Argentina is certainly a better place today than and there it seems like South America is a uh, a place where hyperinflation loves to pop up every couple of years. Um, the redistribution effect is is a great question. Again, I, I'm not here to be political. I'm here to give you my opinion. I think um, I think that the first stimulus um, that uh, was put in during COVID was absolutely necessary and needed to happen um, because people were out of work. People were going to be on the streets. People were going to go hungry. Um, you know, as we get down the road. We're seeing exactly, Christine, what you're saying. And so people that own assets, right, hard assets, housing, stocks, the wealth effect has, when you flood markets with money, right, you know, unfortunately, you know, 50% of this country doesn't have a 401k, you know, home ownership, uh, not everybody owns a home, you know, 30, 40% of the country don't own a home, can't access the capital markets for their business or can access the debt markets to purchase a home so they don't have those type of real assets. So in essence, and it's crazy to think about this, in essence, if you take the bill, the big Build Back Better bill that was being put through Congress, 3.1 trillion, if that were to go through and you have you know, more, and again, this is my opinion, there may be an economist on here that has a different opinion. You put more inflation out there, the people that are going to benefit are the people that own companies that can raise prices, that own multiple houses, real assets, that own stocks through, through their 401ks, 403bs, 457. So I think what you're getting at, Christine, and I totally agree with you, is that the proposal to put 3.1 trillion into the economy is completely counterproductive to the current um, administration's goal of equaling the playing field you know, or at least bringing down, not bringing down, but bringing the lower classes up and the middle class up. I, I, I actually, I think that's what you're saying. And I, I completely agree with you because inflation, who does inflation hurt more? The person that makes a million dollars a year goes to the gas pump and doesn't even look at, at what it costs or the babysitter that's going from Chula Vista to Cardiff, uh, you know, having to drive that every day. And now she's paying $5 and 50 cents a gallon for food instead of, or for food for, for gas instead of $3 and 50 cents. That makes a lot bigger difference for her than it does for the hedge fund guy that's driving to Carmel Valley to a, you know his his office right from Ranch to Santa Fe, and so I think if you think about it in the context, and I, I think a lot of lawmakers, unfortunately, particularly in Washington, have no idea about these economic concepts, right? And you go and you flood flood the markets with all this money, it's going to cause inflation and it's going to by the wealth effect, it's going to cause the wealthy to get wealthier, and it's going to cause a larger disparity between the underclass and the upper class. I completely agree with you. I think that's what you were saying or getting at, but I think that that's exactly right, to be honest with you. I agree. 
Um, was there another question that came up in the chat? I see. Oh, please show Ryan's email. I just put it in the chat there. So if anybody needs it, uh, it's there for you. And again, I, I'm asking each and everybody on here if you have a particular topic that you'd like to see for the remainder of the uh, the spring um, school year here. I'd be uh, greatly appreciative. You don't have to email me directly. Uh, you can certainly email Suzanne uh, at the Retirement Resource Center, and uh, I'll do my best to to uh, build out a presentation on it. Maybe we need a crimer for all government officials that they must take an econ one away. Uh, Joni, actually. <laughs> that, I love it. That's a, <laughs> Yeah, that was actually uh, perfect, Johnny. Actually, they should probably take Econ 101 and 102, which is macro and microeconomics, so they can understand the macro world and the things we're talking about today, and also the micro world and how businesses work and supply and demand and all these different curves and stuff like that. I completely agree with you. And just so you know, I, that, that was my, my, my undergrad was all macro. Uh, I was a double degree in economics and, and finance, and I much preferred the economic side over the finance side. Of course, that's why I'm a financial advisor and not an economist. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Ryan. Question. This was really, really wonderful. Very uh, interesting information. Um, are you okay with us sharing this seminar on our YouTube channel? Because there's a lot of people that- Yeah, ab absolutely. You could, put it on, you could put it on YouTube channel, no problem. Um, the one thing I'll say, it sounded like somebody else was stepping in there to say something. Did, yes. I, did I miss it? Uh, Ryan? Yeah. Yes, please go um, ahead. Gary. Gary, thank you. Hi. Yep. Um, let's take last year sort of a snapshot period. If you have yep. um, a professional advisor like yourself managing a portfolio of a portfolio of hundred thousand dollars for the year for twenty twenty one, what do you think would be the minimum minimum acceptable return? Uh, well, you know, there's so many different types of portfolios, and, I, and I'm not trying to be ambiguous here. Uh, a portfolio for myself at 45 years old, and a portfolio maybe for, for you, I, you know, maybe you're 65, maybe you're 75, maybe you're 55, uh, is going to be different, right? We're at different stages in our life. I'm in a growth stage. I'm in a stage where I want to maximize returns. And so, you know, <clears throat> you know, my wife and I, our portfolio was up 20-something percent last year, not quite with the S&P 500 which was high 20s, but very close. And, and that was primarily due to the, the far out performance of the S&P 500. Uh, we were you know, underweight emerging markets and international markets, but we still had exposure there. I have no bonds in my portfolio whatsoever. I, I believe we're in a rising interest rate environment where bonds are going to be essentially losers for the next half a decade to a decade on a uh, after uh, inflation return. But if I'm you and I'm you know, in retirement, possibly, I think it's a totally different ballgame, right? So most of our clients that are in their 60s that have a, you know, moderate risk tolerance, um, you know, we tried to straddle the line between the equity or stock side of the portfolio and the bond side. We can't abandon bonds for people that are 65 and, you know, have a low risk tolerance. We, we have to have a portfolio of 30, 40%. Well, that part of their portfolio last year returned zero, Right. But what we did is we encouraged our clients in the beginning of the year last year, as we saw this inflationary environment creeping in, to, to bifurcate their bond portfolio and not add to equity, so not to make it riskier per se, but to bifurcate their bond portfolio, and bifurcate their stock portfolio, and put into a hedged equity strategy, a covered call strategy, that for us ended up being the best thing we did all year because that you know that generates five to seven percent income annually. Plus, you got inflation protection because you're owning the underlying stocks, but you're not going to get all the upside of the market, right? And we we're very clear on that. And so that that worked out very well. So our you know sixty to seventy year olds probably did they did double digits for sure last year, but they were definitely not in the twenties or anything like that. I think more importantly, Gary, the question to ask whomever you work with is. In your question is great, is what should my expected rate of return or what should my expectation be based on the risk level of my portfolio? There's something in our business called risk adjusted returns, right? Okay, great. You have your own side portfolio at Schwab or whatever that you buy five stocks, Apple, Google, Tesla, you know, whatever. Last year, it looked fantastic. This year, it looks like a complete and utter disaster, right? So again, it's risk adjusted. I just got off the phone with a client of ours, UCSD, uh, both doctors. Um, and they asked us, we have an ESG covered call strategy built out for them of about a million dollars and then some other stuff. And, uh, you know, they were comparing a portfolio that we actually didn't manage at all. It's just sitting with us, uh, stocks that they've had forever. Well, it's 
concentrated in two stocks, Exxon Mobil and Chevron. Well, energy was number one performer last year. So it looks on paper like their performance was better, right? Because they have these two concentrated positions. But if we took those same portfolios and we measured them 2020, I mean, energy was crushed. So what I told them is I said, you need to co compare our portfolio, an ESG based portfolio to uh, one of the Fidelity ESG. There's two ESG funds within the Fidelity retirement, right? In the 403, 457, which by the way, are just loaded with tech stocks. Like the top seven holdings are all NASDAQ large cap tech stocks, right? And so it's been absolutely slaughtered with the fact that the, the NASDAQ's down 16% and our portfolio's outperformed it by 50%. So again, it's all about comparing to either a benchmark or some type of risk adjusted rate of return. And I think you have to have that conversation with the person you're working with. And if they're not willing to have that conversation, you probably need to look elsewhere. Thank you, appreciate it. Absolutely. And I just want to uh, chime in and say anybody who is like, so what's ESG? Uh, we have a wonderful seminar that Ryan did for us on um, ESG investing on our YouTube channel. So you can watch that. There was a so I'm just writing in the, the yeah, the chat. It's a, the chat. Yeah. A co covered call. Yeah. It's, it's so it's simply an option strategy where you hold an underlying. So let's say you hold 20 stocks. So you, you own Abbott Labs and you own Apple and you own Home Depot and, you know, some large cap stocks that are very liquid and you sell call options against them. And it's a very conservative. You could actually type it into Wikipedia. It's one of the most conservative forms of option strategies, but it's a hedge strategy that will underperform just owning the stocks themselves over the long term. Um, and it will significantly overperform owning bonds or fixed income. Uh, but it has, if, if, if constructed correctly, roughly 40 to 50% less downside than the market. So if this be down you know, 10%, it's gonna be down four or 5%. So we employ that as a uh, in-between uh, for stocks and bonds, for particularly our older clients, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s that um, that understand the concept of rising interest rates and what that's going to do to their bond portfolio and want to do something to hedge that rising interest rate and purchasing power risk. So I hope I answered that. If not, send me an email. I'd be happy. We've got a whole uh, list of things, uh, a whole presentation that we can share with you on covered calls and what it is.